Tonight on Nation to Nation, Enbridge vows to defy the Michigan government and keep its Line 5 pipeline running, while the Canadian Green Party leader backs the shutdown bid. We have been told very clearly uh, through quite a number of studies that should there be a spill uh, on Line 5, that it would be catastrophic. And still in the Great Lakes, First Nations chiefs are asserting jurisdiction over why they oppose aerial spraying of a controversial weed-killing chemical. The horse can't withstand it much longer, and neither can us. We, as the original peoples of these land, we... Hello, I'm Todd Lamoran, and welcome to Nation to Nation. Calls are growing for governments across Canada to ban a controversial but popular herbicide known as glyphosate. It's sprayed over forest and field to kill unwanted weeds and trees. Researchers say it probably causes cancer, but it's approved by Health Canada, so it remains in very wide use. I'm joined tonight by two people who want to change that. Jenica Atwin is a Green MP from New Brunswick, and she introduced a private member's bill to ban it nationwide. Deed Sayers is chief of the Batchewana First Nation in Ontario. He and fellow chiefs want an end to spraying in their region. Welcome to Nation to Nation, Chief Sayers and Ms. Atwin. Thank you so much, Todd. Happy to be here. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Can we uh, Thank you, Chief Sayers. And I'll start with you. Uh, why do the Robinson Huron chiefs oppose this stuff? Well, uh, overall, forest management um, is something that we recognize as still in our basket of jurisdiction. And the aerial spraying um, is something that is is misaligned and contrary to how we perceive the relationship to look today. Um, there are assumptions by the Crown that they have a blank check to be able to do what they will with the force and many other jurisdictions, but in particular with the force. And um, the steps that they've been taking in order to reap the benefit from the force from an economic perspective has been at the expense of, of a lot of things. And when the aerial spray uh, we, uh, we recognize that um, they're killing uh, a lot of species. Uh, they're eradicating a lot of species. They are affecting um, animal uh, uh, reproduction. Uh, the list goes on and uh, we've called for uh, the stopping of the aerial spraying and for a table to be set where we can look at and resolve the unresolved uh, jurisdictional issue. Ms. Atwin, can you tell us what's in your private member's bill, C-285? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. It's 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 very simple. It's to to ban completely, um, you know, possession utilization of of uh, the of glyphosate as a as a, the popular herbicide. But it's under the Pest Control Act. Um, so I know there's going to be lots of opposition to this bill because it's so widely used. Um, I've even had you know people come to me and say you know you're now you're going against science. You know I, I I hope I'm wrong. But if I'm right and we don't stand up against this and we continue to allow monocultures in our forests um, and we you know ignore the potential health risks, you know then I'm not doing my job as a member of parliament. Uh, can you tell me, a, Ms. Atwin, some chemical or something used in history that was banned, uh, that was popular at the time? Well, I mean, I'm thinking of uh, Agent Orange here in, uh, you know, CFB Gagetown as it has a long legacy here in, in New Brunswick, and that was a, a popular herbicide as well. So, you know, this is just kind of the next generation, and it still has, you know, side effects that we need to look at with a, a much closer lens. Um, and so, I mean, we're also concerned about the, the monocultures that are being created, you know, the, the wildlife habitat that's being impacted. So I think there's a long legacy of Canada with, you know, usages of, of different herbicides and pesticides, but glyphosate's been used for Far too long without without opposition. Have you made any overtures to the provincial or federal government about this, about banning this, especially the spraying of it in your uh, jurisdiction? Oh yeah, yeah. We correspond with uh, the premier. We correspond uh, with some of the governments that are asserting um, that jurisdiction, and um, we we have it on a number of our um, discussion points uh, with provincial representatives. Um, we also bring it to the attention of our of our uh, federal counterparts uh, at that level with the federal government. So yeah, it's not a secret. It's, uh, it's well known that uh, we have been very boisterous, very public about our concerns, and I think all of creation expect us to do that. That's our inherent obligation. Uh, Ms. Atwin, as I've uh, kind of alluded to in uh, my introduction and in your previous answers. 
Glyphosate is the main ingredient in Roundup, a uh, popular weed killer available in hardware stores. Uh, it's produced by a global pharmaceutical giant called Bayer, uh, and they've been sued over it. So it looks like you're going to have a lot of opposition to your private member's bill. I mean, uh, uh, what are you going to expect from this opposition? Well, I mean, we've already gone public with, with the bill, um, and there's we've already received a significant amount of opposition. You know, it's widely used in agricultural, um, you know, industry in our, in our country as well. Um, but I really just want to highlight that this is the the culmination of a grassroots movement here in New Brunswick. Um, there's so many voices. There's tens of thousands of petitioners um, that signed on to call for the government to, to act on this. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm a Green Party MP. I'm used to <laughs> experiencing lots of, lots of opposition and to bringing, you know, different perspective to the conversation. So that's really what I'm hoping for here is to shed some light, to bring some awareness to this issue. Um, there's lots of emerging research that we need to be paying attention to. So uh, I'm prepared to, to handle whatever comes my way. I've actually already received a letter from, from Bayer, um, you know, suggesting that their product is, is completely safe. So, you know, we'll see, um, but I'm in it for the long haul. Uh, if it were to get banned, I mean, is there a substitute that uh, people in the industry could use? Well, and that's a great question. And, and again, I'm, I'm focusing a lot on the forestry implications and there's silviculture, you know, human beings could go out there um, and to, to thin um, the, you know, the, the foliage. So we, we know that it's widely used by MB Power here in the province. It's used by Irving. Um, it's used by other, you know, entities as far as, uh, you know, federal land goes. So there are options um, that existed prior to using, uh, you know, herbicides like and pesticides like glyphosate. So it's just about looking at those options again. And I think it could be a, a great way to put people back to work in a meaningful way as well. In 2019, Health Canada declared glyphosate safe in small amounts, claiming it left, quote, no stone unturned as it reviewed the science. How would you both respond to that? And Chief Sayers, I'll start with you. Well, I, I'm sure there are applications that maybe it is safe. Um, when, when we look at um, the experience, our history, um, and we take inventory, we recognize that we are the primary driver. We are the primary government. And um, glyphosate and uh, all of the other practices that make up the sustainable forest license process or forest management systems, uh, in, our, in particular in our neck of the woods, are not based on indigenous um, ecological uh, knowledge, uh, which uh, have been able to maintain our part of the world uh, since time immemorial. And as we look at the overall systems, um, there are so many actions that are contrary to a sustainable forest. When I look and, and drive uh, into the forest, I see clear cutting, I see spraying, I see all kinds of uh, dead uh, forest uh, where they've sprayed. And we know the animals are in proximity to um, these areas, the animals don't avoid a certain area just because somebody sprayed there. They can't read those little signs that you see on, under the power lines or along uh, along in the bush where they're uh, where they're cutting all the, the growth that is going to hinder their their uh, capital uh, profits, the, the profit margins. And and I see where they spray this stuff. It's mainly to be able to maximize the dollar that they can make on that particular particular species so they kill everything that's going to hinder its growth underneath of them and and that's not good like there's a lot of trees a lot of animals that that are filled with spirit and have a role and 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 also have the right to thrive and uh, and we have to find a better forest management system it wasn't very long ago when um, when our people were actually um, a, a part of the system and there was actually some serious uh, listening to us and our people were actually underbrushing and, and undercutting the forests. There was no chemicals. It was, let's maximize the, the chemical use and uh, minimize uh, people on the land to increase the profit margin. So there's many observations that we make and, and the forest can't withstand it much longer and neither can us. We, as the original peoples of these land, we can't shrug our inherent obligations and responsibility to protect all of our relatives. Uh, Ms. Awen, is there anything you'd uh, care to add to that? 
Well, I mean, things are deemed safe until they're not. And I, I gave the example of Agent Orange before, um, you know, that was deemed perfectly safe for, for use until it, you know, was, was deemed to be causing, you know, serious harm. And we're still seeing the fallout from that in, in the community um, that I represent. So um, I like to err on the side of caution. Um, we're seeing, as I mentioned, emerging studies uh, coming forward that we really need to, to closely scrutinize. Um, and again, I, I focus also on the impact on habitat. Um, here in New Brunswick, it's very clear that it's having a negative impact on, on, on deer and moose habitat on, on, the, on the West Coast as well. I'm hearing about you know natural fire breakers um, being eliminated. Um, so we're only protecting softwood and it's, it's, it's a harmful practice in many ways. Um, so there's other angles that we can take, but I certainly hope that Health Canada will, will take a second look here. Uh, lastly, I just want to change gears a little bit, Ms. Atwin. I just want to ask you, what do you think, what do you think of reports last month that your leader, Annie Paul, has had her leadership undermined and has had to deal with racism in the party? Is this still a concern? Oh, thanks so much, Todd, for that question. And, you know, I, I stand in solidarity with, with my leader, Annemie, and uh, I think that there's racism in every institution of Canada. Uh, we need to look at party structures for in the political system as well. Um, and so it's, it's important that we have these conversations, and we're open and honest, and we're naming things for what they are. Um, so she knows that I'm behind her, and we're working towards addressing, you know, any issues that, you know, that may, may lead to complications for her leadership. And so um, it's important that we, we discuss this. So thanks again for that question. Okay, Ms. Atwin and Chief Sayers, I want to thank you for this conversation, and I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thanks so much. Thank you. Miigwech for the time. I'm off the After the break, I speak to the leader of the Green Party about the ongoing dispute over a pipeline in the state of Michigan. Welcome back. It's a deadline that came and went. Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer had given Enbridge until noon yesterday to shut down its Line 5. It's a pipeline that carries crude oil from Western Canada to Michigan, across the Straits of Mackinac, and on to Sarnia, Ontario, where a large percentage of petroleum products for Central Canada are manufactured. Governor Whitmer calls the pipeline an environmental ticking time bomb. The issue is already being litigated in an American court, and earlier this week, the federal government filed a motion in that case to express their support of Line 5. Meanwhile, the Anishinaabeg Nation supports shutting down the pipeline, along with Green Party leader Anna Mee Paul, who joins us now. Ms. Paul, welcome to Nation to Nation. Thank you so much for having me. Why does the Green Party want Ambridge Line 5 permanently shut down? Well, first and foremost, what we want to do is to respect the uh, the decision of Governor Whitmer to uh, to close Line 5, to end the easement uh, that uh, has been granted to Line 5. And we also want to inspect, uh, respect rather uh, indigenous, um, indigenous nations uh, on both sides of the border who have also made it very clear that they would like to see Line 5 closed. Um, you know, we have been told very clearly uh, through quite a number of studies that should there be a spill uh, on Line 5, that it would be catastrophic. Uh, and so we, we have no reason to doubt uh, the results of that research. We have no reason to doubt uh, the nations that have told us that they believe it's in the best interests of, of the Great Lakes. Uh, and we have no reason to doubt Governor Whitmer either. Now, Anbridge claims the pipeline under the Straits of Mackinac has operated safely for 65 years and that plans to encase it in a concrete tunnel will just make it safer. Why shouldn't we believe Enbridge? I wouldn't say that it's necessarily a question of believing Enbridge in terms of the encasement, but what we do know is that hasn't happened yet. Uh, and clearly, Governor Whitmer, who was elected on a commitment to shut down Line 5, isn't willing to wait. Uh, neither are uh, the nations on both sides of the border. Uh, we, we have alternatives, as I understand it. We need to do more analysis here in Canada about those alternatives. But uh, I think that the conclusion clearly uh, by, by many people who are deeply uh, connected with and uh, would be affected by a spill is that it's too dangerous to wait uh, for the few years that it might take to encase the uh, pipeline as Enbridge has proposed. It's estimated that shutting down the pipeline would add an additional 800 rail tankers and 2,000 trucks to highways to ship the crude oil. Is this not as bad or worse for the environment, let alone safety? Yes, I've heard those estimates mentioned uh, here and there. What I would say is that uh, the government of Canada has not yet conducted its own independent analysis on the implications of closing Line 5. 
Uh, they have not conducted their own independent analysis on alternative sources for fuel if should Line 5 be closed. Uh, they have not uh, um, conducted an analysis either on whether there may be uh, sufficient excess capacity in our existing North American pipeline system that services the Great Lakes region either. Um, much of the data and the estimations that are being bandied about uh, at this moment are the result of, uh, of studies done by corporations, studies done by Enbridge and other interested groups. Uh, the government of Canada has a really important role to play here in ensuring that there is independent data to confirm uh, any, any uh, decisions that we make about what comes next. We've seen what's happened in the U.S. with the shutdown of a critical pipeline there due to a ransomware attack and the result has been panic buying at gas stations and the threat of skyrocketing fuel prices. How concerned are you that this could happen here with the shutdown of Line 5? My, my, I would only be concerned if we don't ensure that uh, our government uh, reassures people. Uh, this is really not a time to be stoking fear or panic, and I would invite all of the parties uh, to join me in, in ensuring that that doesn't happen. Uh, we know already from the, uh, our ambassador to the United States that uh, while this is a, a serious issue with respect to energy supply in Canada, it is not a question of energy security. We also know that uh, Enbridge and their competitors like, um, like Suncor uh, have already begun to make their own contingency plans. We know that uh, the airport, for instance, Pearson International Airport, has also said that they have diversified their sources of fuel. And so there is no reason to believe that if we do the, don't you know, do the careful planning and analysis that Governor Whitmer has done, that we also um, can't avert uh, the worst case scenario. So let's not talk about the worst case scenario as if it's uh, already here. Um, so you don't believe that there could be a potential job loss jobs lost in Sarnia and Alberta that could be in the thousands, if not tens of thousands? Well, I think that it's really too bad that we don't have the answer to that question uh, because, as I said, we have, we have known for years now, we have known since 2018 that Governor Whitmer intended to shut down Line 5. She was very clear about it when she ran to become governor of Michigan. It was one of her key promises. And I can't think of any reason why uh, our governments, uh, governments, federal or provincial, would have ever believed that she was going to renege on that key promise. And so this is the second time uh, in a year that we have uh, been caught out uh, by assuming that a project was perhaps too big to fail or too big to close, uh, and we haven't made the arrangements that we should. So the thing that we need to do now if we're looking to protect, to protect jobs, and we really should be seeking to protect as many jobs as possible, is to come up with a plan so that if Line 5 is closed and we don't control uh, whether it's closed or not, that's very important to emphasize, if it is closed, even without us wanting it to be closed, uh, that the jobs are protected to the greatest degree possible. That's the responsible thing to do in this situation. Wouldn't a permanent shutdown put pressure on the federal government to resurrect the cancelled all-Canadian route called Energy East? Mm. I, again, I, I, I don't want to, uh, to guess at the answer to that, only to say that the studies that Governor Whitmer and environmental, uh, environmental groups in the United States uh, have uh, had commissioned uh, prior uh, prior to this month, um, you know that they have been uh, releasing over the last year or so, all indicate that most of the capacity that is, you know, most of the capacity of the of line five can be served via the excess capacity in the existing pipeline system. We don't know that for sure because, again, we don't have the analysis on the Canadian side of the border. Uh, but there's, you know, as, as we talk about possible scenarios, we also have to entertain that possibility as well. Um, we should be working with the United States to begin uh, investing in the infrastructure that is going to support alternatives to fossil fuels. Um, Canada has one of the cleanest electricity grids in the, the world, for instance. We should be working um, in a cross-border way uh, to, to, uh, to ensure that, that energy can travel across our shared borders. Um, we should be using money to invest not in a new pipeline project, 
uh, from west to east in Canada, but investing in a coast-to-coast-to-coast 100% -coast -coast, uh, renewable uh, um, electricity grid. That's really the future. Um, that's where other uh, big economies are moving. Um, there's a green rush going on to make sure that uh, big economies are, are positioned uh, for the new green economy of the future, and so that's really where our investment should be. Uh, later this month, of course, the uh, government of Michigan and Ambridge are supposed to have another meeting. Um, do you think this has all just been posturing and some sort of resolution will come out of that meeting to keep the pipeline? Uh, <laughs> I, I would definitely bottle and, and sell the ability to, to look into the future if, if, I, if I could, if I definitely could guarantee the outcome. Uh, I believe that Governor Whitmer is entirely sincere in her promise and commitment to keep line, I'm sorry, to keep the promise to, uh, to end the easement and to close line five. Uh, we, we saw that there were many who believe that uh, that um, President Biden was posturing with respect to Keystone, and they learned that, in fact, he wasn't. Uh, Governor Whitmer was a part of President Biden's campaign team. Uh, she has staked her reputation uh, in Michigan on closing Line 5. I think it would be very, very foolish of the, uh, our government to base any plans for the future on the hopes that we either win a court case or that Governor Whitmer ultimately settles uh, with Enbridge. Uh, it's not impossible, but I think it's very unlikely. Uh, finally, I want to ask you about something a little bit different. Uh, last month, of course, there were media reports about racism, racism in the Green Party and that your un leadership was being undermined. Have these issues been put to rest to your satisfaction now? Well, as I've been saying all along, my focus is very much on introducing myself to people in Canada, um, starting a new conversation, given that I've been in this role for just over six months now. Uh, I am very committed to uh, diversity in our party. I would, uh, I ran on a, a platform of, of diversity, democracy, and daring. Uh, we have some really exciting initiatives that we got off the ground uh, very quickly, including our Time to Run campaign, which is, is, is seeking to attract a very diverse slate of candidates to run for us in the next election. So my commitment uh, to diversity in the party is very, very clear. Uh, I'm also someone who, who respects the party, respects our members, and when we have conversations internally, I, I never discuss those externally. All to say that I'm very proud and excited to be leading the Green Party. I'm very proud uh, about uh, the initiatives we've launched to diversify the party, and uh, I'm looking forward to continuing that work for as long as I'm the leader. Okay, Ms. Paul, I want to thank you for your time today. Thank you so much for having me. We'll have more after another short break. Welcome back. That's another episode in the books, and our season is rapidly coming to a close. But before it does, we're going to try something new next week. We're going to have a debate over Bill C-15. It's currently being fast-tracked through Parliament, and it aims to make sure the laws of Canada comply with the principles of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, or UNDRIP. Arguing for the passage of Bill C-15 will be former NDP Member of Parliament, Romeo Saganash who, when he was still an MP, nearly had his private member's bill on UNDRIP become law. Against it will be policy analyst Russ Diabo. He says, since this is federal legislation, it still falls under colonial doctrine. Should be an interesting debate. I'm Todd Lamoran, hoping you're still safe and keeping healthy, and thanks for watching.